let's wait a few minutes for everyone to get here. Wait another minute or two, but you can go uh, to Blackboard right now and you should be able to see the final exam problems. You should see two assignments for the final exam. Um, each of them, there's a PDF, that, and then they are both due next Friday, the 15th, at uh, 5 p.m. And they're basically going to be the same format as any of the computer projects. You have to do both of these. So why don't you take a minute or two to read them while I wait for more people to log in, and then we'll discuss them and what they're about. See, still just uh, eight students logged in. for one or two more people. All right, so here's what we're gonna be doing. You've got two problems to solve. The first one is a fairly physics-y problem. We're going to again consider the distributed Bragg reflectors, alternating quarter wave layers, except that in the middle of the system, we're going to put a cavity, something that has a different thickness. And I'll let you figure out by trial and error what that thickness should be. And if you pick it correctly, you're gonna get something that looks like this. This is a plot of transmittance versus wavelength. And you can see that there is a pretty wide band of wavelengths at which you get no transmittance except right here. 
at this spike. And people design things like this all the time in order to just transmit a single very specific wavelength and so you're going to uh, play around with that. And you're going to have to figure out how does the width of this peak, the full width at half max, so if we were to look, this is like, it's, this is a peak reflectance of about 0.96, sorry, peak transmittance of about 0.96. So you figure out, well, where, what, what's one wavelength where this is 0.48? What's the other one? The difference between those is the full width at half max. And you're going to have to figure out how that depends on the number of layers in each of the DBRs. So we'll assume that this is symmetric. If you don't make it symmetric, it turns out that you wind up getting lower reflectance, sorry, lower transmittance at that resonant wavelength. Now, I could derive this for you. I could, and I'm not just doing this to sort of be perverse and hide something. If I were to derive this, I'd have to set up a whole bunch of transfer matrices. We do some algebraic gymnastics, and at the end, we would get a result. I want you to figure it out through simulations, partly because I think it's more enlightening to actually see how it works, and partly because, frankly, that's the way a lot of things are done. A lot of the time, people don't know in advance what the theory is. They just examine either a bunch of experimental data or a bunch of simulation data and look for the pattern. So I want you to figure out the pattern from the simulation results. And I tell you what to make it from, tantalum pentoxide. I tell you to assume air and a glass substrate. Um, did I actually say SiO2 is the substrate? If I didn't say it, then I will revise the assignment to say that. But the substrate should be glass because that's what these things would be commonly made out of. Any questions? All right, then let's look at the lens problem. So the lens problem comes from some articles I found on COVID-19. Um, I started off by reading, um, where is it? Um, open source tech for COVID-19. And this is a survey of a lot of different open source technologies, meaning technologies that aren't under patent, so legally anyone could make them and produce them and uh, distribute them and sell them. And they go through a whole lot of these things. And at some point they came up with uh, something, they mentioned something called detector, which is, they mentioned something called detector, and then they also mentioned that you could do it with an open source plate reader. And a plate reader is, um, well, let's just look at what a plate reader is. And the participant list. A plate reader is something where you've got a whole bunch of little, basically test tube holders, sometimes Petri dish holders, but very small Petri dish or test tube holders. And the idea is that you could have easily 100 specimens in there. And you've got a motor that moves this thing around up and down and left and right. And it moves it so that you can place one of these little uh, circles, one of these little test tube holders at a time in the middle of an optical train. So the optical train just means a setup with, um, a, with a beam path in it. So here's a light source up here. Here's our array of test tube holders. And then here's some more illumination optics if you want to illuminate from the other side. There's a lens somewhere in here and it sends light to a fiber. And this is not a camera. You're not going to get high resolution images here. What you're basically assuming is that within that one test tube, everything is well mixed, so everything is homogeneous, which means that you don't need to take a picture and look at different sections of it. Um, and you're just basically asking the question, what wavelengths does this transmit? What wavelengths does this absorb? 
What wavelengths does it respond to? What wavelengths does it, reflect, does it fluoresce at? And you can answer any or all of those questions by varying the kind of light source you use. If you want to get transmission, you send the light from up here and whatever gets through to the other side you measure. If you want to do fluorescence, usually you would illuminate from the same side that you detect on. You would send the light laterally, sorry, diagonally like this. It would hit the specimen. You would get uh, stuff fluorescing right near the bottom of it, so right near the collection lens. It comes out and then you detect that light and it goes through some fibers, then goes through some filters and you look at the spectrum of it. And you know, this is all set up for a particular condition. You, know, you decide in advance, all right, I'm gonna have something that fluoresces at 594 nanometers. So if I see something fluorescing at 594 nanometers, well, I chemically modified that so that it would bind to coronavirus RNA. So whenever I see fluorescence at 594 nanometers, that means we've got coronavirus RNA. If we get a lot of fluorescence at 594 nanometers, that means we have a lot of coronavirus RNA. Now all of that goes, that whole determining that coronavirus RNA will fluoresce at 594, that comes from some biochemistry work. That comes from this article, which normally you would need a subscription to get, but it's available for free online. A lot of coronavirus research is available for free. And this was just published, and they, I, I can't tell you how good this test is. All of this needs to be replicated. Our goal here is to say, all right, if this test is good, if this test really does pr uh, produce a definitive signal as to whether or not there's coronavirus RNA, then you know, how much light is this thing going to collect? So we're just going to assume that there's something in here that whenever you've got coronavirus RNA produces 594 nanometer light. And then we're gonna ask a couple questions about it. We've got a lens here and it's sending light to a fiber. And that lens, if you look at the product specs um, in the, uh, let's see, I will go to here. If you look at the product specs, which, is which are available in the supplementary materials, they tell you who they got this lens from. They got it from Thor Labs. It's part number ACL1210U. And if I go to the manufacturer website, which is linked here, then we've got the ZMAX file available. And for this lens, Thor Labs has been good enough to give you an unlocked ZMAX file. Sometimes they give you a black box, meaning that the specs are in there and the computer can see them, but it's set up so that it won't display on the screen. You'll never be able to read it. But Thor Labs was nice enough to make this one available. It's called an aspheric condenser lens. You can download that ZMAX file. And there are all the specs. And one thing to notice is that this is an A-sphere lens. All right, normally we've just been playing around with the radii of curvature, the thickness, and the semi-diameters. But this one was specifically designed to be non-spherical. So besides having a radius of curvature, it also has a conic constant, and it has a fourth order term. And so you will need to um, figure out what, you will need to do a few things. You're gonna need to figure out, first of all, what range of angles would be um, mapped onto our detector? Because if we look at the diagram, all the light that's coming straight out of the sample, of course, goes to the fiber, except it gets spread out over some range, right? It doesn't get focused to a perfect point. 
So if we were to look at light coming off axis, well, depending on what off axis angle it was coming at, it might still hit the fiber or it might be focused away from the fiber. So I want you to figure out what range of angles this thing collects. Now, the reason why we collect over a limited range of angles isn't that we expect the light emission from most fluorescent samples to be biased in the forward direction. Um, it's basically that if we can collect light coming at a wide off-axis angle, then we could potentially get light from another specimen over here. In these plate readers, the uh, specimens are pretty close together. So there's always the danger of crosstalk. There's always the danger that more than one specimen will be glowing and light from more than one specimen will make it to your fiber. So there's a number of strategies that people use to prevent that. For one, they try to make sure that most or all of the light goes onto one specimen. They also use a narrow fiber so that you know, they're not collecting over a huge area. And then they try to restrict the range of angles that they could see the light from. And so I wanna know, in principle, what range of angles could they collect over if they were to redesign the optics before they would get a significant crosstalk. So one thing you're gonna to have to ask is, how far off axis could the light be? So would the light have to be? So that the intensity on the edge of the fiber is less than 0.1% of the maximum intensity. Like, let's say that we look at some off axis light. It's focused to a spot right here. Well, that spot has finite size. And at the middle of the spot, you're gonna have high intensity. At the edge of the spot, you're gonna have low intensity. How far away would this have to be so that that spot of low intensity is just past the fiber edge? And then finally, what if we didn't use a spherical lens? You know, most of the semester we've been talking about spherical lenses, but now I'm giving you the specs for an A-sphere. And I want you to see how much would performance differ if we took a well-designed spherical lens? And so you'll design your own spherical lens. You'll use the same shot glass that they use, same diameter and center thickness so that it still fits into this apparatus. But whereas they use something that's flat on one side and aspherically curved on the other, you have the option to make both surfaces um, spherical. And rather than playing yourself by trial and error and seeing, all right, I'm gonna try this radius of curvature and that one, just use the optimization toolkit. And use the optimization toolkit when this parameter and this parameter are zero and see how good that spherical lens is. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so I just wanna, clarify what we're doing. Uh, so when we make our ZMAX file for this, our left side where our source is, that's going to be like the equivalency of the light coming off of the specimen, right? Yep. Okay, then we'll go through the lens. And then do we get a diameter or radius for the fiber? Or how do we decide when it's still, I mean, is that just a point? Like, we are going to assume that the fiber has a uh, radius of 200 microns. Oh, I didn't put that in there. Okay, so okay, this, yeah, that's a yeah. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Thank yeah, you. I'll put that in there um, as soon as we're done on this. But yeah, that should be a 200 micron fiber. Um, so let me put those edits into the files right now. I looked at the Ocean Optics website. They said that they got their fiber from Ocean Optics, so I looked at their website and they never said, even for this part number, there are a few options, but Ocean Optics said they typically recommend a 400 micron diameter. So we'll assume a 200 micron radius. Um, yeah, that's one thing we'll assume. So what you would basically need to do is figure out, um, 
Oh wait, it's going to, it's probably not going to like that because I am trying to compile a file that's already open. So let me redo that. Right, so yeah, the rays will be coming in here and then you will just have to figure out um, the actual area that would be allowed to hit would be plus or minus 200 microns. So you play with things and see, well, when do we still get that the center is within 200 microns of the axis? And you might be thinking, well, I could just use y equals f tan theta. You could if this thing has no aberrations. But if there's any field curvature, if there's any distortion, then all bets are off. So you're gonna to have to actually do it in Zmax and play with the field angle. Other questions? The other thing I forgot to change is the multi-layer problem. I never said what the uh, substrate is. So let me just and I should close that file before I compile. Other questions? All right, um, so I'm just gonna stay online for as long as people wanna look at this and read through it and think about it in case you have a question. Um, I will be available throughout the next week. You'll upload your files in the usual way. Um, I am told that the university will be reaching out to you to administer student evaluations. And finally, I will say, I hope this class has been useful. And anytime you uh, want me to look at a resume, I'm happy to do so. If you're looking at jobs in the optics industry, I'm happy to talk anytime. If you see a job ad from a company and you wanna know if I know anybody there or know anything about the company, by all means, reach out to me. I can't promise to know everyone in the industry, but I know a few people and I'll tell you what I can. And I know this has been a decidedly suboptimal structure, but I hope you've still found something interesting about the optics. Uh, this is my favorite class because I get to play with toys. I get to talk about the things that I learned from my friends in the industry and show you things I've done in my research, and I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of it. So with that, take your time, read through the final exam, ask questions if you've got them, Otherwise, log off, ask questions anytime. Have a good day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Small. You're welcome. I'm sure I'll be emailing you throughout the <laughs> couple of weeks about this. I'm, yeah, I'm always happy to take questions on this, and I'm always happy to take questions on the optics industry. Cool. So, Dr. Small. Yep. Um, for so for this second problem and we're doing when we're doing the the spherical part mm -hmm. um do you have any suggestions on kind of where to start to look at uh what to look at in terms of performance i would just look at the wavefront error because okay. we're looking for diffraction limited performance here or something close to diffraction limited if at all possible okay cool. thank you you're welcome
Uh, so, Dr. Small, on the, uh, uh, which one is this? The, uh, the Python one, the layers one. Mm -hmm. uh, you say to start with uh, under your, you say to start with n equals six and increase in steps of two. Yeah. And you say that you'll probably find that four to five n values are enough to establish a trend. So does that mean that we'll want to attach uh, four to five of these uh, graphs of the angle of incidence? No, I just attach one graph. What, what, what about angle of incidence? Everything's at normal yeah. incidence. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I realized that's equal to zero. I thought that was the title of the graph at a quick glance, it's not. No, so you I only need one transmittance graph um, just show me on this graph, oh, I figured out, you know, you'd show me this graph, then you would zoom in on it. So here, I'll just go into uh, Spider and do that. So we're supposed to start with six and then go up to eight layers, 10, 12, so on, and then try to look at what kind of trend that makes in the plot. Exactly. Okay. Why is it not running? Oh, there it goes. All right, so you get a plot like this, and then you would tell me how you figured out the full width at half max. Just by zooming in on it and saying, all right, the peak is about 0.968, so you would need about 0.484, so the peak would be around oh, here, roughly from 0.5315 microns to 0.5325 microns, and the difference between those would be the full width at half max. And you might need to use quite a few wavelengths because this is very narrow. So if the number of wavelengths is small and the range is wide, then the spacing will be wide and this peak might not be noticeable at all. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Dr. Small. Have a good day. You're welcome. Yeah, have a good day, Dr. Small. You too. Miguel, any questions? Mm, yeah, I just have one. So. Sure. So to so for question two on the lens question, mm -hmm. it uh, asked to find the how far I've access the intensity changes. Yeah, and I'm not sure if we're using the PSF cross section or the diffraction and circle of energy to really investigate that, or are we using some PSF. other analysis. The PSF. A PSF, because the diffraction and circled energy is looking at the integral of the PSF around a ring, whereas the uh, PSF itself, if we go to Huygens PSF cross-section, and we'll normalize it to make it easier to interpret. All right, so here's the peak value. You know, we'd want to sample it uh, better, but... Here's the peak value. And so, all right, here it's a peak of one, and down here it's, you know, point oh, oh whatever. And so you might have to go a little bit further out to figure out where you have to go 
so that the intensity is 0.1%. But the thing to keep in mind is that this is the center position of the image. Now, if we change our field angle, go to one degree, it's gonna take a while to calculate. Those off axis cases are always harder, especially at fine, but they need the fine sampling at the same time, all right? Now this is the position, and we'll again, oh, I see what it's doing, I see what. So now what you're looking at is the distance from up here, all right? So somewhere around here is the center of the image, and you are, and so this distance here is gonna be so many microns, not from the optic axis, but from there. You'd wanna make it so that the, um, you know, that if here's the center of the detector, and I have no idea if this is 200 microns, it's not 200 microns, um, it's 0.15 millimeters, but so we, or 150 microns, but anyway, you know, we'd have to make it a little bit larger, and um, then a little, bit, a little bit larger, and the center would be 200 microns from the center of the fiber, and then a little bit larger still, so that the tail of the PSF was 200 microns from the center of the fiber. Make sense? Yes, yeah, that makes more sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Um, no, that covers up with the questions I have right now. All right. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Bye.